Well, here we are. Three years, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe it? I've been doing this for three years. And what better way to celebrate than with a story that's been sitting in the vault for more than 18 months. That's right. Back in March 2017, I was sent this phenomenal story, and it's taken me all this time to get round to doing it. And when you hear how good it is, you're going to be wondering why I haven't done it before. Well, I might be able to spin a good yarn. But, well, I can't organise my life quite as well. But here we are. This one is a very, very special, and I've been keeping it for a special occasion, and tonight fits the bill. So once again, sit back and relax with your favourite drink, my dear, dear friends, because it's now three years that I've been asking you to listen. Dr. Gnard was reading when he heard a knock on his office door. Friday, 7pm, was reserved for one person and one person only. Come in. I brought him, sir. Nurse Simons opened the door, and the first thing the doctor saw was the teenager's game face from behind the nurse's shoulder. Ah, swell, swell. Let him in, please. The nurse stepped to the side, letting the boy enter. Thank you, Samantha. I'll take it from here. I want coffee. This was no surprise to the doctor, but the nurse seemed appalled by the boy's shameless demand. Very well. Two coffees for me and my guest, please. Nurse Simons gave the doctor a long, questioning look. Something wrong, Sam? The boy asked, mockingly, over his shoulder. The nurse pressed her lips together, closed the office door, and Power walked to the kitchen to brew what had been requested. I like her. The boy approached the doctor's table and sat down in front of him. Um... Black, please. The chessboard was already arranged, and, yes, the black pieces were already on his side of the table. Uh, you've gotten predictable, the doctor said. I'll have you know, in chess, you have to choose the color with intellect, not superstition. The boy laughed. <laughs> I'm far from being superstitious, Doc. I choose black because it's tougher to handle. Right. Oh, and the pieces are shinier. Look, the white ones are sandy and boring. The doctor laughed at that remark and made the first move. He loved playing chess with the boy. The kid might have only been 16, but he could focus harder and invest more patience in the board than all of his university pals combined. The doctor needed some relaxation from the working week he'd had to endure. The institution he was running was, after all, one of a kind. Ever had that one kid in school who everybody would turn out to be a psycho serial killer? Well, unless he finds an outlet for his bad stamina, such as sports, sex, or digital realities. Well, in earlier times, when a kid would throw a tantrum, it was just a kid throwing a tantrum, until that tantrum resulted in bloody murder. Nowadays, tantrums are being taken a bit more seriously. Too seriously at times. Dr. Gennard's specialty is to differentiate between plain old mood swings and serious signs of mental illness. The clinic he's running is the perfect place to hospitalize a child in, in case one can't tell whether he belongs at home or in a sanitarium. A patient's complete evaluation would usually take somewhere between three to seven months. However, there were cases in which the end results were too shallow and the patient had to stay hospitalised for two more months after the seven-month period was over. Marius had been a patient for almost a year. Concentrate, the doctor said firmly, after snatching a black rook from the boy's side of the board. Marius grinned in contempt. Due to his opponent's previous move, he managed to take a bishop from right under his nose. I am. Marius was losing, however. He had lost the previous week too, and the week before that. He knew that the doctor could tell his head wasn't in the game anymore. Who could blame him? The clock was ticking. Son, your results came in. The doctor heard a soft crumbling of fabric coming from Marius's direction. 
He didn't have to look under the table, because he knew that the boy had a death grip on his pants, where his palms were resting. And... The doctor tried putting on the most angry adult face he could muster. If he had to scare the boy upright, he knew he had to play smart. Really smart. Smarter than before. I am very upset with you. And why is that? Because you lied to both Dr. Rakesh and Dr. Sullivan. What makes you think I lied, Doctor? Well, probably because both of them consulted with one another after interviewing you, and also took a look on your CB test. I know it, and so do you. Your answers don't match your brain activity. Marius's eyes moved from the chessboard to the man in front of him. He knew it was coming. The clinic was famous for the CB test. It was very similar to a lie detector test, but more elaborate. The patient was exposed to different video footage, some of which was incredibly violent. In the process, his or her reactions were not only measured through your standard brain scan, but also through heart rate, body temperature, pupil dilation, vocal reactions, muscle contractions, skin humidity, and tactile sensitivity. Yes, tactile sensitivity. The test was first named Impacto, but since that name was considered to be stupid by most of the staff members, they just adopted the name CB, which the hospitalized children had given it throughout the years, CB being short for Cannonball. I wasn't lying. Oh, really? To Marius' big surprise, Dr. Gennard took a stack of papers out of the drawer nearest to him, as if he had specifically waited for him to say that. If that's the case, mind telling me why you told Dr. Sullivan that you, and I quote, get off on tiny animals getting skinned alive, whereas your EEG portrays signs of severe distress when you're shown such footage. I'd be happy to do the EEG again. Yes, but the CB test isn't made out of just the brain scan, Marius. Your entire body was rigid with fear, and your face muscles were contorted in disgust all throughout the test. Yeah, but... This was your fourth CB test these past six months. I've never had a patient who required more than two. Reflects how, how messed up I am. Rakesh said, you cried during the part with the kitten. He's a piece of shit, and you should mind hiring more competent doctors. Dr. Gennard's fist met with his desk with an echoing slam, followed by merciless plops of chess pieces on the floor. I'm done with you trying to take me for an idiot. Marius finally managed to get him angry. The boy knew this day would come eventually, and even though it came considerably later than it should have, he wasn't ready for it. I'm neither Rakesh nor am I Sullivan, so you better start explaining to me what this crap is all about. It's been a year, boy, a year! You've been here longer than some doctors I've employed, and it's high time we get to the bottom of your condition. What is there to explain? I'm ill. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Then why do all your psychological evaluations tell me you're the sanest, healthiest patient I've ever housed? Because your methods are outdated. I'm a sick and disgusting human being, and I deserve to be locked up forever. Marius broke. He brought his hands up to his face in shame, as tears violently spilled out of his enraged teenage eyes. Dr. Gennard watched him for half a minute, waiting for the boy to unload some of his demons before dropping the bomb on him. Marius, I'm sending you home. No! <laughs> Marius sobbed quietly. I'm sorry, son, but I have no choice. Yes, you do. Lock me up. I'm fucked in the head. I'll sign anything. Just please, don't make me go back there. 
Dr. Gennard considered his next move very carefully. He got up and around his table to crouch down next to Marius's seat, something he never did with a patient before. But he had gotten attached to the boy, and it infuriated him that no matter how many tests he took, no matter how many discussions he had with him, he never found anything out of the ordinary, something, anything that would explain the child's paranoia. Listen to me, Marius. Look at me. Marius made an effort to keep tears from blurring his vision. You will be 18 in less than 14 months. You will be an adult, and you will be allowed to move out of your parents' house if you dislike it so much. 14 months is not a very long time. You don't understand. Listen to me. If there's something you're not telling us, domestic violence, physical abuse, or anything objective about your family which you've hidden from us. I'd be happy to put you in touch with... What? <laughs> Domestic violence and physical abuse? <laughs> Dude, my mum and dad were the sweetest, most loving parents in the whole freaking world. They still are, son. This, this right here is the exact reason why I lie to you people. Those shit tests you run are useless. Nobody believes me. You demand truth, but when it comes to mine, you're all deaf and blind. And what is your truth, Marius? Oh, fuck no. I'm done repeating myself. You don't believe a word I'm saying. You think I'm mental. He chuckles after hearing himself. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? You think I'm mental, and yet you insist on sending me back home. God, what is the purpose of this place again? Tell me one thing, boy. How can a mental asylum be better for you than your warm, welcoming home? Marius got up and started pacing around the office, trying to shake off the need to break down in tears again. You know, this place is too big for just two housemates. What are you suggesting? I'll clean. All day. Every day. No days off. No nothing. You don't even have to pay me. Just let me stay here. I couldn't do that, even if I wanted to. Why not? Because your parents are still your legal guardians, and they requested to have you discharged. Marius went livid as that information sunk in. There it was. The ultimate resolve. He could cry all the rivers in the world. It would not prolong his stay this time. Didn't I already tell you, Doc? He stared the man in the eye. And even though Dr. Gennard had heard this hundreds of times before, it still sent shivers down his spine. Those things are not my parents. Rakish always refused Gnard on his wine office, until tonight. Sullivan was already pouring his second glass, and the three doctors hadn't even begun to discuss why they were having their Saturday evening meeting on a Thursday afternoon. Gentlemen, I'm running out of ideas. Gnard's exhausted forehead greeted the expecting palm of his hand. Sullivan and Rakish sunk on their heads in agreement taking several minutes to think of a smart way to break the silence. Wouldn't it be a good idea, Sullivan attempted, to try the hypnosis again? Definitely not. We tried it, and he had the worst panic attack I've ever seen. I agree with Barvin, Gennard said gravely. Not going to lie, I did consider it for a while, but it's too risky. We're trying to make his traumas go away, not get worse. Precisely. Besides, hypnosis has never worked on patients with cup grass before. Sullivan emptied his glass, reaching for the bottle to pour another. I still don't agree with that diagnosis, Bav. The cap grass syndrome prevents people from recognizing loved ones because they can't connect their faces to the feelings they're supposed to have for them. Which is precisely Marius's case. Wrong. We showed Marius pictures of his family from back when he was little. 
He has nothing but love for his parents and sisters. Remember the joy on that boy's face when we asked him to tell us about the day he got lucky for his 10th birthday? We even have the proper CT and EEG to prove it. Capgras patients are exactly the same. You're wrong. Capgras patients can't recall feelings. They suffer from a disconnection on a cognitive level. And you mean Marius doesn't? He's saying his entire family was murdered and replaced by doppelgangers, for Christ's sake. You show me one Capgras case. One in which the patient tells his story with absolutely no gaps in it. Just one case, Varvin. <laughs> and I'm putting your name in my will. <laughs> if you'll leave me both the mansion and the lady, I'd be more than happy to research with you, John. <sighs> Don't bother. Gennard's voice sounded like something from the other side of a tombstone. The two doctors looked at him, waiting in vain for him to lift his head out of his hand. I search for a Capgras case that comes close to Marius's. The doctor removed the hand from his heavy skull and reached for his bottom desk drawer. He retracted a rather big stack of papers and threw it on the table, missing the wine glasses by just a few millimetres. Almost two hundred typewritten pages landed in front of Rakesh and Sullivan. For the first time in my career, I got nothing. Whoa, you've written quite a bit for someone who's got nothing, Sullivan remarked. The curious case of Marius Krepp. <laughs> Sounds like a creepy pastor if you ask me. Are you mocking me, Donovan? Sullivan jerked in his seat. Dr. Gennard's eyes revealed the fury of a desperate man, not necessarily pointed at him, but irritable nonetheless. All gibberish. I thought I was on to something when Marius said he doesn't remember how the dog was killed. Capgras patients don't have explanations for how doppelgangers replace their loved ones, but Marius, as you both know, well, that boy has an entire story behind it. Rakesh and Sullivan pressed their lips together and nodded. Yeah, but you say he doesn't remember how the dog was killed? Yes, because while that happened, he was tied in the basement and was forced to watch someone or something making a copy of his mother. What happened to the mother afterwards again? <laughs> she turned to water. Can't we blame his passion for horror literature on his wild imagination? Hardly. I confiscated all his dark books and DVDs for the past six months. I asked him to repeat his story two weeks ago. The story remains the same. Uh, could we, um... Sullivan began, but Rakesh shook his head violently in his direction. Could we what, Donovan? Rakesh gave Sullivan a very disapproving glance. Sullivan inhaled deeply. Oh, I know that I'm suggesting a very unorthodox method, but, well, couldn't we suspend the boy's senses somehow and ask him to tell us again what happened? You mean, drug him? There was silence in the room. Gennard placed his forehead in his comforting hand anew. Rakesh whispered something like, I told you to keep your mouth shut, in Sullivan's direction. And, as Sullivan tried whispering back in his defense, Dr. Gennard's right hand snapped towards the wine bottle, brought it to his lips, and kept it there until it was completely empty. He placed it back on the table with a gentle ding. I've tried that, too. Rakesh and Sullivan grasped greedily awaiting further details. I like playing chess with the boy. He's highly intelligent. I once told him, if he beats me, I'll share a bottle of whiskey with him. <laughs> Let's just say I let him win. The other two exchanged worried glances. Max, he's only 16 years old. Oh, Donovan, you just suggested I drug the boy, and now that I beat you to the punch, you want to go Mr. Conscience on me. I thought you hated hypocrites. Sullivan twitched. 
I'm sorry. Gennard shook his head apologetically. Please don't take it to heart. It's just... Well, I'm desperate. Sullivan nodded, and Rakish reached out his arm to place it on Gennard's shoulder. How did it go? he asked. Oh, look at the dark circles under my eyes. What do you think? No breakthrough, huh? Nothing. I found out he read one of his mother's Sandra Brown novels and liked it. That Barker is the horror master, not king. That he hates Crystal Andrews for telling the entire class he's a bad kisser. But, well, what he had to say about the night of the 28th of May 2016 was no news to me. The story stays exactly the same. This time, Rakish looked distressed. What else did you try? It was Sullivan's turn to whisper disapprovingly. Hot. Rakish and Sullivan's eyes widened. Oh, come on, boys. We're doctors. We all know the good it can do. Well, in limited amounts, of course. The two mumbled approvals. Still nothing? Nothing. And what worries me most is that I actually feel that I've earned his complete trust. He likes me. Of that I am certain. Judge me if you must, dear friends. But I came to the conclusion that this boy is no liar. Nobody said he is, Max. He's simply ill. We just need to find the cure for his illness. Gennard looked at his knuckles. Bones were protruding more than usual. He had lost weight. Do we? To the other's surprise, Dr. Gennard placed another bottle of wine on the table. He took his time opening it and spoke after he managed to fill all three glasses and place the bottle back where he took it from. I say, we look upon the matter from a different perspective. And which might that be? Gennard stared at his glass, admiring the deep, rich color of his liquid ease. Hmm, hypothetically speaking. He looked at his partners, and his deep blue eyes told them everything they needed to hear. Sullivan and Rakish suddenly feared for their boss's sake. Marius told us the truth. The silence that followed was tense. Gennard thought his partners were as open-minded as he was, but they were no fans of David Hume, nor were they as long in the field to truly be able to tell the difference between an ill person and a healthy one. Marius's mind was a healthy one. Of that much, he was certain. The truth is objective, you know, Rakish said timidly. I disagree. We know you do, Sullivan interfered. You bring yourself to the patient's level, and that's exactly why you're a good doctor. And also why I'm a bad one, right? No, no that's not what I... Understand him, Gennard thought to himself. Max, I think you need to take a break from this case for a while. Gennard had to bite his tongue down not to bark at Rakish to mind his own business. I don't think I need to. Rakish and Sullivan both knew what that statement meant. And they let out a silent sigh of relief. I plan on sending the boy home. Now, from a clinical point of view, it was a very bad decision, seeing how the boy's condition didn't get any better in the past year. But the doctors were running out of books to read, and Marius was a thorn in their intellect. Medically speaking, the boy's mental health was obvious, which means he was probably just seeking attention. Healthy or not, the entire staff wanted to get rid of him. All except one, that is. I'm meeting the parents tomorrow morning. I'll try explaining the verdict, and I'll decide where to go from there. But if all goes well, Marius will be out of here by Saturday afternoon. Rakish and Sullivan finished their glasses with subtle smiles on their faces. And for the first time in over two decades, Dr. Gennard 
regretted ever hiring them. Next morning, Dr. Gennard was finishing his first of three coffees when he heard the knock at the door. It was too soft to be Nurse Simon's, and too firm to be somebody's whose visit was not expected. Come in. Marius's parents did just that. They were early, just like the doctor had asked them. Ah, Mr. and Mrs. Crep, thank you so very much for coming this early. After exchanging pleasantries, the pair sat down in front of the doctor. Even though both of them tried to look fresh and excited about taking their son home, exhaustion dug into their features as mercilessly as time did. Would you like some coffee? Mrs. Crep flinched. She was taken aback by Nurse Simon's presence behind her. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you come in. No, no coffee for me, please. I'd like a glass of water, if possible. Of course, madam. Anything for you, sir? Water sounds good. Thank you. After placing two glasses of water in front of Mr. and Mrs. Crab, the nurse left the office in a hurry. Ah, I see you're not big fans of coffee, the doctor remarked. The two were slightly surprised by his observation. You have paid me monthly visits for the past year, and not once did you take Samantha up on her offer of coffee. There was silence for a couple of seconds. Uh, we, um, don't actually like coffee very much, Mr. Crep said. Our household is sort of coffee-free. We only buy some when we expect company, completed Mrs. Crep. Well, you're going to have to buy some pretty soon, because Marius loves this stuff. Dr. Gennard raised his mug slightly in front of the two, both in cheers as well as in demonstration of his statement. As his head pulled back to enjoy the last mouthful of the liquid black gold, the Kreps exchanged a quick glance. Now then. The doctor placed his empty mug in the far end corner of his desk and reached for the drawer where he knew he'd find Marius's latest test results. You've let him drink coffee? Mrs. Kreps' eyebrow was twitching. I thought we talked about how serious our son's insomnias are. Honey? Oh, don't you honey me, Christopher. Mrs. Crep placed both her hands flat on the desk, her elbows demanding more space. Doctor, my son's sleepless nights are what caused this insanity in the first place. We know you're a professional, and we entrusted you with taking care of Marius. But for that, we agreed on one thing, and one thing only. No coffee. Mrs. Crep, this may come as a shock to you, but a cup of coffee in the morning is a stimuli for a rich, eventful day, and the more energy you invest, the more you are guaranteed to have... No! No coffee. We didn't agree on you picking up new rules as you go along. We said no coffee from the get-go. Honey... This time it was Dr. Gennard who lifted his hand to silence Mr. Crep. Your son hasn't had a visitor for a whole entire year. What are you talking about? We've... I'm not talking about you and your husband, Mrs. Crep. He refuses to see you. Therefore, you don't count. Mrs. Crep looked insulted. I'm talking about friends. Classmates, other relatives... Nobody has come to see him, and that boy has been the perfect patient. No trying to run away, no complaining about the food, no sneaking girlfriends inside the facility when the guards aren't paying attention. His room is always clean, and nobody has had anything to complain about the way the bathrooms look after he has taken a shower. Now, if you've been in this business for as long as I have, you really learn to appreciate a patient that minds others. On top of that... Everybody here loves him. Now, I know what we agreed upon, but you see, Marius never asked for special treatment. He never demanded anything from me, except coffee. He loves it, and here it's free for everybody anyways. 
I'm sorry, but I couldn't refuse your son's one and only pleasure throughout his stay. Mrs. Crepe's elbows withdrew to her sides, and her palms contracted into fists. She didn't say anything to get back at the doctor for violating their agreements, but her stare didn't show that she approved of his actions either. Now, can we please discuss your son's latest test results? The mother was too angry to talk. Medical stuff. Well, rationally, anyway. She turned her head to the side, giving cue to her husband to take over. Yes, of course. The doctor turned to the husband. Uh, we've already discussed the possibility of Marius suffering from Capgras syndrome, a disease which doesn't allow him to link familiar faces to the emotions they're supposed to provoke. Yes. We have reasons to believe the illness in question is not Capgras at all. What are you trying to say? You see... Capgras is a psychiatric delusion that derives from paranoid schizophrenia. Well, except for the belief that you two have been replaced by unearthly imposters, Maria shows no signs of mental instability whatsoever. Mrs. Krepp laughed dryly. <laughs> replaced by unearthly imposters? Fucking ridiculous. Honey, please. Oh, give me a break, Christopher. Tell me, Doctor. If our son would have told you he saw Santa Claus on a cold August night, would you have laughed in his face or told us he needs psychological evaluation? Because, no offense, I don't see how the first option, justifiable as it is, would have brought you any income. Cheryl, that's enough. You mean to say, I've been keeping your son here for the money? Oh, I don't mean to point fingers at anyone, but... It's not like you're funded by the state or something, now is it, Doctor? Mr. Krepp's face was burning with shame for his wife. He was trying to apologize for her behavior, but the woman's words shook the doctor so achingly deep, he couldn't even find the proper tone to defend himself. I'm not keeping him here for the money, Mom. The woman puffed and crossed her arms over her chest. Dr. Gennard was struggling to come up with an appropriate way of telling her that he'd grown fond of the boy, and that the reason he still kept him in the clinic was that he was genuinely worried for both Marius, as well as the rest of the family's sake. There was a minute of silence as Dr. Gennard mentally evaluated if telling Marius' parents the recent test results would be of any use. He decided, spontaneously, he wanted the two of them out of his office, so he cut straight to the chase. From a clinical perspective, your son is as healthy as can be. Mr. Krepp shifted in his seat. I'll sign his release tomorrow. Why not today? Mrs. Krepp was making eye contact again. We're here. The car's outside. It makes no sense to me why we'd postpone this for tomorrow. But I do. He's been, by far, my most favorite patient in years. I need to explain this to him properly. It's a sudden decision either way. I don't want to make things worse for him than they need to be. What in the world are you talking about? We're his parents. We're the ones who brought him to you in the first place. Outbursts like this one is why the doctor never considered marriage. Mr. Krepp took his spouse's hand in his own. Like... Are you sure we'll be able to pick him up tomorrow? If he needs another week or so to settle with the thought, we'll be more than happy to wait. Mrs. Krepp was on the verge of dismissing that possibility, but one look from her husband reminded her who was wearing the pants in this family. No, I already told Marius he'll be going home this Saturday. I think him going home tomorrow is for the best. We don't want to give him too much time for he might just use it to plan something none of us would wish for. The couple understood what the doctor was going to say. Is that all right? They both nodded. By the time Mr. Krepp got up to shake the doctor's hand, Mrs. Krepp was already out of the office. Oh, please excuse my wife's behavior, doctor. She's still upset because of the coffee situation. I understand. I'm truly sorry if I violated her trust. 
but the boy really loves his daily cup of joe. <sighs> yeah, I know. <sighs> Takes after his good old dad. Mr. Crep shrugged. There's nothing I can do, Doc. My wife's a nutritionist. She knows this stuff better than me. She usually says nothing when our daughters empty the cookie jar in one go, but caffeine is a complete no-go. Bone crusher is what she calls it. The doctor frowned. Even green tea? For a second, Mr. Kreps seemed to be at a loss for words. Uh, yeah. That's odd. I never heard of a nutritionist banning green tea before. It's full of antioxidants. Well, so is fruit. The doctor tried not to show that Mr. Kreps remark bothered him somewhat. Indeed, he said, smiling at him with almost no laugh lines to show. Mr. Kreps smiled back and assured him they'd come back the following day around 10 a.m. to take his son home. The doctor nodded in agreement and watched him leave his office. Gennard turned to the window behind his desk and watched as Nurse Simon's translucent form opened the door timidly. Uh, two big cups of coffee, darling. I'll have mine with almond milk and a tablespoon of honey. The nurse nodded. Should I get Marius to come see you? Uh, there's no need for you to do that. Marius is here. Marius's hand crept from behind the doctor's chair in the far end corner of the office. The boy revealed himself, scaring the nurse half to death even though the doctor warned her about his presence mere seconds prior. I'll have mine black, Sam. Thanks. The lady nodded and left to bring the coffee. She sometimes wondered whether Dr. Gnard's therapy methods were genius, or were they just straight up insane. Hours passed and Marius had yet to win a match against the doctor. He was definitely trying. Gennard could tell that much. Could we please address the elephant in the room? Marius was looking for ways to get Gennard's bishop without having to sacrifice his queen in the process. Oh, you're ruining my concentration. I know, but we're running out of time. You mean I'm running out of time? The boy made a move. Your turn. But first, can I have another cup of coffee? Gennard was addicted to the dark elixir himself. He felt so sorry for the boy, knowing he'd have to live either without it or drink it sneakily for the next year or so. Sure thing, kid. You can have as much coffee as you like. Oh, can I have the next one with a shot of bourbon in it? <laughs> as long as you don't tell anyone. I'd like to keep my job, if that's all right. I won't tell a soul. <laughs> I owe you that much. Gennard confiscated Marius' queen, and the boy let out a long and whiny negation. The doctor laughed at the pitiful face he made. G you won again. No, I didn't. Not yet, at least. Marius moved his king to a very vulnerable position. That was stupid of you. I disagree. We both know I'm stuck. I'm just saving us ten minutes. Gennard looked at him. It was easy to see that Marius was clinging to every minute that separated him from the following morning. Can I go ask Sam for another coffee? The doctor smiled sympathetically. <laughs> you sure love coffee, huh? Uh, no, I don't. The doctor wouldn't have been more surprised, even if a bullet had been shot through the window right then and there. <laughs> You're choking, right? Marius shook his head. As long as I have caffeine in my system, those things won't be able to touch me. He'd heard the boy's theory before, and, just like the first time, he was fishing for information with the fascination of a child. And why is that? Caffeine has an effect on those things like sodium has on demons. It sets up a barrier they cannot cross. And how do you know that, if I may ask? <laughs> Told you. On the night they got to my family, I was writing an essay that was due the following day. I had two Red Bulls that evening, and they sensed it. 
They made me watch as they were copying my parents, in hope that I'd piss myself. The boy was telling the story with such ease now. The doctor could hardly believe it took him almost two months of therapy to get it out of him in the first place. Doc, do you ever get scared? What do you mean? I mean, so scared you pissed yourself. If it were any other patient, Gennard would either have snapped at them or simply lied. But this was no ordinary patient. This was Marius. His chess partner and the most intriguing case he had ever dealt with. Yes, I did. Marius looked at him expectantly. Oh, you don't want to know. Yes, I do. At that very moment, something inside the doctor's head clicked. He had opened Pandora's box, and he knew it. I was thirteen. I woke up unusually late that morning, and, on my way to school, I saw three of my classmates torturing a stray dog in the park next to the school premises. It was too early for the streets to be crowded, and way too late for me to get to class on time. Uh, I'd never been the heroic type, but I've always been an animal lover. I dropped my bag and went straight to them, yelling at them to leave the pup alone, and that, that they were being cruel. Gennard's chest felt tight. They laughed at me. The fat one came at me, punched me and threw me to the ground. I tried defending myself, but I was a small and bony kid. Puberty was a year and a half ahead of me. The fat kid forced me to my knees with my hands behind my back. He was pulling my hair so that all I could see were the other two. Marius's fingernails were digging in his knees. He had a feeling where the story was going, but he couldn't find the words to ask the doctor to stop. The kid in the orange sweater was holding the dog by a leg. I don't remember his name, nor his face, but I remember Jason, the third kid. Jason liked playing with firecrackers. Marius covered his nose and mouth with his hands, his eyes pleading for the doctor to stop. But Gennard warned him, and there was no turning back. Jason said, If you tell anyone, you're next. And then he lit up a firecracker. Oh no, please stop. And placed it in the dog's snout. Marius hid his face behind the palms of his hands. I pissed myself after it exploded. Several minutes passed until the boy broke the silence. That was shitty of you to tell me. You wanted to know. He removed his hands from his face, revealing gleaming cheeks. Why are you crying? The boy stared the doctor down with pure hatred in his eyes. Did my story remind you of your own dog? Marius avoided eye contact. I think it's about time you tell me what really happened to it. The pause that followed was heavy, as heavy as water when felt from the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Lucky. Marius clenched his fists like one would when trying to bend iron bars. The dog's name was Lucky. An inexplicable shiver crept up and down the doctor's spine. It was something about the way Marius said the dog's name that made him want to call his parents and tell them that he is adopting the boy. Something about his eyes that made him see, no, not Marius Krepp, but himself, Maximus Benjamin Gennard, a 13-year-old boy who peed his pants because he was too weak to save a dog. Marius looked at him with so much hatred that, well, he finally understood. He understood wasted typewriter ribbons and over 200 pages of writing a thesis on a patient that was undoubtedly completely healthy. He finally understood why he'd kept Marius for a year in the clinic. Because he believed him. He believed every single word that came out of that boy's mouth. Oh, 
I'll tell you what happened to Lucky, all right. But first, you tell me what those demons told you. They told me Lucky never existed. <sighs> Did they now? <sighs> that much was to be expected. Marius had an explanation for every aspect of his trauma. Dr. Gennard had stopped being surprised by the fluency of his story months ago. They killed him before they managed to make a believable copy. Those things can't copy what they can't see. They tried copying Lucky after killing him, but it was no use. The head, the head was all messed up. The ears were off and the left side of his face was droopy, somehow, and its eyes were dead. Everybody could tell that it was no ordinary dog. They didn't want to risk it. I understand. Oh, I doubt it. What happened to Lucky afterwards? What does it matter? You don't believe me anyways. Just tell me. Oh, can't you just... <laughs> Marius started crying again. Can't you stop fucking with my head already? I don't want to remember this shit. This is the last night of ease I get before going back there. His voice broke, but the doctor was as rigid as sandpaper. I'll ask again. And this time you better quit being a sissy. The boy's wet eyes widened. Gennard had never used that tone with him before. What did they do with Lucky's body afterwards? And that's when Marius understood. He wasn't alone anymore. They buried him in the backyard, by the oak tree, towards east. Go get yourself a cup of coffee, and then go to your room. Are we making a farewell inventory now, or after I get my coffee? Oh, there will be no farewell inventory. Dr. Gennard stood up. You're not going anywhere. He drank coffee after coffee and Red Bull after Red Bull. His head was racing and his conscience was screaming at him in the voices of his mother, his university teachers and all his respected friends and colleagues from the medical field. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But he knew he had to do it. It was the only way to know for sure. If Marius's family had been killed and replaced by doppelgangers, there's no way he'd let them have the boy. Dr. Gennard stopped the car in front of the house at 52 Bourbon Street, the Crep residence. His watch showed 3.02 a.m., and the house, as well as the suburban neighborhood that surrounded it, was dark and quiet. Dead to the world, with a revival appointment for after the sun comes back up. Gennard got out of his car, and got a shovel and a hoe out of his trunk. The neighborhood was a quiet one, and, as with all safe neighborhoods, the fences were just shitty excuses for delimitating private properties from common asphalt. Gennard stepped over the fence like it wasn't even there. He gave subtlety a try, by ducking and approaching the backyard on all fours in the safety of shadows projected by pompous flower bushes. It was dark, but the streetlights that were peppered here and there illuminated enough for him to find the oak tree. It was a beautiful tree, thick and elegant, rising above the level of the house, guarding over its inhabitants, but not forgetting to also keep a watchful eye over the rest of the neighborhood. It was the perfect place for burying bodies. Gnard wasted no time. The shovel cut through the portion of earth showing east, with the fury of someone who was trying to dig out a lover that had been buried alive. He was merely two feet deep in the ground when sweat started tickling his brow. The doctor dug and dug and dug, and for a second, he actually started having second thoughts about the whole thing. Was he the mad one? He was a renowned doctor. His office walls were full of rewards and recognitions, and yet, here he was, digging out a patient's backyard because of a supernatural possibility. He was about to insert the sharp head of the tool into the ground again, but then he saw something rather odd in the soil. 
a weird texture, something that shouldn't belong within the earth, but above it. It was the same colour as the dirt it was sunken into, but Gennard knew it was something else. He knelt down and patted with the tips of his fingers. Hair. He was most definitely touching fur. The doctor let out a small gasp and continued digging for the dog with his bare hands. What a beautiful animal it must have been while it was still alive, he thought. He removed the earth off the dog's torso as best he could, but his main objective was to uncover the pet's head. Dr. Gennard grabbed the hoe and began removing the fertile clay from the animal's skull. It took him several minutes, and even more pats, to discover that, where the head was supposed to be, there was, well, nothing. Just bits of flesh that dried out, feeding the oak tree next to it. As if someone, or something, ate its way out of the poor thing. As if someone or something bit its head off. As if, someone, or something, had placed a firecracker in his snout. Marius's words echoed in the doctor's head. They killed him before they managed to make a believable copy. They can't copy what they can't see. Gennard saw red before his eyes. His life thus far, his career, his patience, his colleagues and prestige, none of it mattered. All that mattered was that he was angry and that someone had to pay. Dr. Gennard, what are you- The doctor didn't even miss a beat. As soon as he heard Mr. Krepp's voice behind him, he grabbed the shovel resting next to him and turned with the speed of light smacking the man's face with it. At least, that's what he intended to do. He wanted to immobilize the creature and ask it who sent it to the human world and what its business was. He wanted to immobilize all of them, see if they reacted to blessed crosses and holy water, because if not, Dr. Gennard would have to buy sacks upon sacks of coffee, not to mention energy drinks and tea bags. However, the sound the shovel made when it came into contact with the thing's head was not your usual thump. It was fleshy. Sharp and fleshy, like the sound of a butcher knife when penetrating a fat pig's belly. Furthermore, the thing that landed on the ground didn't move. It spasmed once or twice, but it stopped moving shortly after. It was dark outside, but by now the doctor's eyes had adjusted to the scenery enough to know that what was oozing out of the thing's head was blood. Human blood. Gennard approached the body and, with a gasp, dropped the shovel right next to it. He had cut Mr. Krepp's face across the eyes. The left eye was still stuck in the shovel's blade, white and full of veins with a long, red, interrupted connection to a vital part of a very human brain. If these creatures could only copy what they could see, how would they know what the back of a human eye looks like? God, no. What have I done? He heard two women screaming and a little girl crying. He heard Mrs. Krepp yelling to her oldest daughter to get her sister and lock themselves in the bedroom. The woman was screaming at the dispatcher to send somebody straight away, because her son's psychologist had just gone psycho himself. Time stopped for the doctor. He stared at Mr. Krepp's corpse and the shovel resting next to him, thinking what he could possibly do to reverse the whole encounter. He stared at the corpse, with tears running down his face, muttering words of apology. He only moved from the spot when four police officers pulled their guns on him, demanding of him to raise his hands up. He couldn't see them, neither could he hear them. 
seeing that their orders were falling upon a mind that had shut itself down. Two police officers tackled and cuffed him, dragging his defenseless form towards the car. Gennard felt nothing. His head was back in the psychiatric clinic, where he was replaying every discussion he'd ever had with Krep's son. Suddenly finding the biggest and most obvious gap in the boy's story, he had asked Marius numerous times why his parents would want to hospitalize him if they were actually out to get him. His answer was prompt and precise. These things want to fit in, he said. They want to blend in with us humans, learn our ways and habits. They hospitalized me because I was being hysterical and the neighbors heard me. They hospitalized me because it was the proper human thing to do. How would they know what a proper human would do in that situation if the things could only copy what they could see? Maximus Benjamin Gnar had nothing to say in his defense. Not even his lawyer could be of any help. The good man tried desperately to convince Gennard to bejewel his side of the story with a pitiful read it of the stray dog and firecracker event from his childhood. Gennard didn't budge. By the time the trial was over, Gennard had his attorney tearing his hair out. I'm as guilty as the worst of them, he said. I'm a sad excuse for a human being and a disgrace to my profession. No punishment would be severe enough, Your Honor. And the judge agreed with him. Trespassing, violating private property, and first-degree murder. Dr. Gennard was on his way to a place where the thought of freedom was just as fantastic as the plot of a sci-fi novel. Doc, you got a visitor. Gennard turned his face to look at Officer Novak. He was confused. He would only still receive visits from Samantha on the first Wednesday of every month. But today was Sunday, and he'd seen the nurse just four days prior. I keep asking you nicely not to call me that. <laughs> I'm not getting paid to be nice to you, you shit-eating, shovel-waving ass-crack. I said, you got a visitor, Doc. Gennard let out a tired exhale. He turned his head back to Deshaun the only friend he had in his sector. They were playing chess, and it was his turn to move. Rain check? The old man asked, with an understanding smile on his face. No, it's unexpected, so it's unimportant. I don't like unannounced visits, so I'll make it quick. Wait for me. Gennard sat up. Oh, don't bother moving the pieces. I know exactly where I left everything. Didn't even cross my mind, Max. Hey, listen. Lunch is in 20. In case you don't show up by then, you want me to wait? Or should I go on without you? I'll be back in time for lunch, as well as this match. <sighs> you never know, man. I just told you how I feel about unexpected visits. <laughs> Death's the only unexpected visit, my friend. Gennard smiled at the witty comment and followed Novak to the visitation room. He didn't even bother looking at his visitor while approaching. He already knew who it was, either Rakesh or Sullivan. Those pieces of garbage. Gennard killing Mr. Krep was the best thing that had ever happened to their personal finances. The two of them cashed in on his 200-page case study, and after getting their hands on it, the press was merciless. They extracted quotes out of a paper that was supposed to be for sheer scientific purposes and gave them outrageous contexts. According to the media, Dr. Kennard had planned to kill Mr. Krep all along because he was somehow infatuated with Marius and wanted him to become his own son. Kennard took a seat and grabbed the receiver. At first, he didn't recognize him. His shoulders were broader and he had facial hair. His hair was different too. Style and posture weren't the same either. Mm, the boy had grown. Marius! Gennard's voice broke, 
his sight getting blurry. He started shaking his head slowly, overwhelmed by the unexpected encounter. Hey, Doc. How have you been? Gennard's lacrimal glands ruptured before his former patient, making him feel pitiful and angry for not being better prepared. <sighs> Come on, man. Pull yourself together. Don't make me start the waterworks, too. The former doctor wiped his eyes and nose rapidly. It cost him a lot of courage to look at the man Marius had become without breaking down. He knew the boy hadn't come to shove reproaches down his throat. Well, didn't seem like it anyway. I'm sorry. It's okay. No, dear boy, it's not okay. I'm truly sorry from the very bottom of my heart for everything. Maria shook his head and raised a hand for him to stop. Hey, I'm the one who's sorry. You're in here because of me. Nonsense. Please, Doc, just let me say what I came here to say. Gennard was shaking. He doubted he had enough self-control to hear the boy out. He didn't want to hear Marius blaming himself for what he had done to his father. He wasn't worthy of the boy's forgiveness, let alone understanding. Oh, I should have come to see you a long time ago, but I was so ashamed. The former doctor was sobbing with the yearning of an abandoned child. If it weren't you, it would have been me. Oh, I was really out of it. No, son. You were confused, and it was my job to make you well again. But I failed. No, you didn't. Look at me. I'm better than ever. I... Marius smiled a little to himself. I got into med school last year. It wasn't easy, but I'm in. I'm all about human anatomy and the aging process now. I've been wanting to tell you this for quite a while. The former doctor's bottom lip quivered. <laughs> That's great, Marius. Congratulations. Oh, uh, thank you. I've also gotten a dog. Named him Lucky. Gennard's face paled instantly. Marius laughed. <laughs> Kidding. Gosh, you're easy. Something in the air had shifted. It was a strange, tingling sensation. Gennard felt the need for oxygen, so he inhaled greedily, welcoming the tingly air within his being. His insides, however, didn't take it as well as usual. <laughs> Remember the mutilated dog you found in my parents' backyard that night? <laughs> this is some funny shit. Hear me out. Gnard could feel the air liquefying somehow. He could feel it sliding down his airways, resting in his lungs and spreading to the stomach. He wanted to breathe, but each mouthful of air felt too thick to reach its purpose. He also felt very warm all of a sudden. He was sweating profusely, and not just from his armpits, but from his head face, arms, and crazily, from the legs too. Gennard felt like he was melting. My parents had just wanted to surprise me with a pet for when I was to be discharged, but well, the damn thing moved in front of a moving car. <laughs> Stupid mutt. Crazy coincidence, huh? He laughed again. There was something odd about the boy. Something was not quite right with his face, and it was making Gennard sick just by looking at it. So, it's true. Lucky never did exist. Nope. Why did you lie to me? Think about it. You're the mind doctor. You tell me. Why do people lie? Gennard could barely articulate. But because they have something to hide. Oh, really? That's why. Darn it. I was hoping you'd say because they're bored. Oh, well, we don't have to agree on everything. Marius looked left, then right. He got closer to the glass, and Gennard had an inexplicable gag reflex. 
Hey, how'd you like it in there, Doc? Under normal circumstances, Gennard would have told him, Oh, it's not so bad. But something about the boy made him want to weigh his answer very carefully. He couldn't decide on one, so he left Marius' question unanswered. You want to get out? Because, between you and me, I'm going to get you out of there. The former doctor's eyes got wide, so he looked around at the guards, wondering if it would be a good idea to ask them to escort Marius out of the building. I mean, you yourself are doomed, but you'll still be able to walk around. Sounds good? What in the world are you up to? Let's just say, I'll work something out. Marius, thank you for coming to see me, but... I really think you should go. Don't worry. I don't plan on making you even more uncomfortable than I already have. Marius got up, still holding the receiver, and hunched down, as if his proximity could make Gennard hear him better. You want to know why I really came to see you, though? Gennard felt like he was boiling, but no one else could see it. Not the guards, nor the other inmates. The one person who was enjoying the show of his suffering was his former favourite patient. As I said, I really like you, Doc. Besides, I can't copy what I can't see. Well, you know what? If you have to go back and listen to that one again to get everything, then I recommend you do it. I've read through that so many times, and each time I find something new in the story. Little hints here and there that lead you to the ending and what was to come. Now, I didn't pick up on all of them the first time, so I'm sure you didn't either, but all the little hints are there. Go on, go back and give it another listen. Come on. (laughs) Well, that's it. Three years done. Here's to the next three years. But you don't have to wait that long for another story, because I'll be back again on Friday with something pretty special for you. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?